Hola amigos. As promised in the last video, today I bring you a full tutorial on how to simulate tentacles and other similar effects using Niagara. Here I use them to bring this very simple creature to life, but the base is quite flexible and can be used to achieve a large number of effects. The PlayStation 5 game Returnal is an excellent example of this, and the inspiration for me to create this effect. A word of advice before we begin. This is gonna be a long tutorial, so grab your popcorn, buckle up, and let's start with a quick breakdown of how all this works. The first step is to spawn some particles and place them at a specific distance from each other. Both of these numbers, the distance and the number of particles, will be spokes as user parameters later on. Next, we apply some forces, just like we would do with any other particle system. Here I have a curl noise and a gravity. And finally, and this is the important step, we are going to apply a simplified constraint to the particles so they keep attached to their neighbors. Let's use these three particles to explain how this constraint works. Every frame, after applying and solving the forces, each particle will have moved and in most cases they will be further or closer to each other than they should be. The algorithm checks every particle and finds out how much should it move in each direction to be at the appropriate distance. Then it moves the particle the average of those two. After repeating this for each particle a large number of times, the solution converges into a decent approximation of a physically correct constrained pendulum motion. Once we have this particle skeleton, we can apply different rendering methods, such as sprite or mesh rendering. Since Unreal 5.1, ribbon rendering is also supported when using GPU particles. And with the theory part out of the way, we can jump into an empty scene in Unreal and put all that into practice. We'll start by creating two different assets. First, add a Niagara system and select the bottom option in the template dialog to create an empty system. This will be the primary effect. Give it a name and now create an actor blueprint. This one will be our collision handler, but we won't need it until a bit later in the tutorial. We'll still add the system to the actor now, so we don't forget later. Open the blueprint and add a Niagara's particle system component to the list. Next, select the system that we just made on the drop-down list or drag it from the content drawer to the property panel. With that, all the setup is complete. Let's open our system in the Niagara editor and start working on it. Before we add the emitter, we need to take a look at the system properties and enable fixed bounds, which is a prerequisite for GPU particles. I'm leaving the default size values, but you can change them to increase how far off screen the effect is still rendered. Now, add some user parameters to expose some of the effect settings. First, an int32 to set the number of nodes, and then two floats, one for the node distance and another one for the weight. I'm keeping things simpler here, but feel free to add more parameters to the list to have more options to tweak. I've named these parameters link count, link distance and link weight because I'm a Zelda fan, and also given them some default values. After that, Right-click on any empty space and add an empty emitter. In the Emitter Properties panel, we need to change a few things. Set the same target to GPU, the Bounce mode to Fixed, and check the Requires Persistent IDs option. This last one is important since it is those fixed IDs what allows us to keep track of each particle's neighbors.
Now we also need to give this emitter a name, which we will use later, and add some properties. The first three will have the same type and name than the ones that we created as user parameters earlier. Link count, link distance and link weight. Next, add a Niagara position type variable, which we will call origin position, and then a particle attribute reader variable. You can rename the last one to something like PAR or just remove the new from the default name, as I'm doing here. We don't need to add steps to the emitter spawn stage, so we can skip that one. But add a new step to the emitter update stage and search for emitter state. This will add a bunch of default variables to the emitter attributes list. On the properties panel, change the lifecycle mode to self, the loop behavior to once, and the loop duration mode to infinite. This will make our emitter spawn all the particles once and never cycle until destroyed. Now, add a new scratch pad module to the emitter update stage. Scratch pads are custom steps that we can create using a node system similar to blueprints. This first one will simply set some of the emitter variables. Using either the plus button on the node or the one on the parameters panel, add one input variable to the map get for each one that we created on the emitter earlier, matching its type and name. Remember, we added link count, distance and weight, origin position, and particle attribute reader. If you cannot find existing variables in the parameters panel, make sure that you are on the active overview tab and not in the active module one. I don't know why I kept switching while I was recording this video. Next, repeat these steps on the map set node, but change the namespace to emitter. If this sounds confusing, you can think of the namespace as a prefix that helps the engine find these variables. For example, on the left we would have input.linkCount, and on the right we would have emitter.linkCount instead. Once you have all of them, connect the matching variables on both get and set maps. Summarizing, this scratch pad is taking those inputs and using them to set emitter variables. This will let us use those system variables that we started with. I'll give you a moment to finish this part. Back in the system overview, select the module that we created to see its properties. First, change the emitter name property to match this emitter, to fix the warning in the particle attribute reader. Next, replace the default values on link count, link distance and link weight with the user parameters and change the origin position to simulation position. This will update the emitter variable with the coordinates of the particle system in world space. The final step that we need to add to this stage is a spawn burst instantaneous, which, with some luck, will be at the top of the list, in the suggested section. On this one, just change the spawn count to the emitter property link count. You can find that one on the bottom left panel. Before moving to the particle spawn stage, let's add a simple sprite renderer at the bottom so we can see what we're doing. Once that is done, we can add the initialize particle step to the spawn stage. We can leave all types on the top row. For now, we'll just change a couple of the settings in the point attributes section. First, and this is just for visual pleasure, I'll change the color to something more festive, like this hot pink. 
Beautiful. Next, change the mass mode to direct set and replace the value with the emitter's link width property. Now we need to make another custom scratch pad. Add one to this stage and name it something like particle or link setup. We're going to write some initial properties on the particles, including the position and whether or not each particle is at one of the ends of the chain. Just like we did in the previous scratch pad, add the following properties to the map get, all from the emitter namespace. Link count, link distance, origin position, and particle attribute reader. In the map set, for now just add the particle's position. Oh, and I almost forgot. On the map get, we're also going to need the execution count, which is in the engine namespace. Add that one now as well. To calculate the initial particle positions, first we're going to multiply the number of particles represented by the variable link count by the distance between them. This will give us the maximum distance between the first and last particle. Now add a normalized execution index and multiply it by the previous result. This will give us a value for each particle that goes from zero to the maximum distance. And since we want our particles to spawn downwards, we need to negate this value and then use it as the Z component of a new vector. Note that this last value is just an offset, so we need to add it to the spawn position. In our case, we know that all the particles spawn at the local origin, so we can use the emitter variable origin position. Now connect the result of this last operation to the particles position in the map set. And to tidy things up, we can add a comment to this group of nodes and give it a reasonable label. It could be a good idea to check if things are working as intended. Press the apply button at the top of the graph to compile the module and apply it to the stack. If you followed along, you should have a few particles in a vertical line. You can go back to the user parameters now and change the values if the sprites are too close together. Before going back to the scratch pad, we need to add three more particle variables. The first two are booleans, name them isStartNode and isEndNode respectively. Their names should be pretty self-explanatory. The third one is a float, which we will name mass multiplier. We'll use this value as a quick way of stopping fixed particles from moving later. Add these variables to the map set of our new scratch pad. We'll take care of this now. To do it, we'll use the execution count, which is the total number of particles spawned. Since the indexes start at zero, if the count minus one equals the index of any particle, that means that that particle is the last one in the chain. Similarly, if the index equals zero, then that particle is the first one in the chain. If this sounds a bit confusing, don't worry, just follow along and copy the next set of nodes. Lastly, 
the mass multiplier can be set by converting the is start node value into a float and then applying a 1 minus operation. This will be used later to set the mass to 0 for pinned particles and preventing them from moving. We can now frame all the nodes in this section with another colorful comment and continue to the last part of this scratch pad. Since we don't want to do any kind of searching to find out particle neighbors, we are going to store those references in each particle. We'll need two new variables for that in the particle namespace. The type is Niagara ID for both. One of them will be named previous ID and the other one next ID. Add both of them to the map set of this scratch pad, just like the other variables. To get those IDs, we need the indexes of the previous and next particles. However, we need to prevent this operation from trying to read values outside the array of particles. To do this, after subtracting 1 from the execution index, get the maximum of this value and 0. Likewise, after adding 1, get the minimum of that value and the execution count minus 1. We can, in fact, reuse this last value from the previous group. Now that we have the index for both neighbors, we can use the particle attribute reader to find their IDs and store those in the map set. From the particle reader, add a get ID at a spawn index and connect it to the maximum, and then add a second copy and connect it to the other output. If you copied and pasted this node, like I did here, don't forget to redo the connection to the particle attribute reader as well. Finish this scratch pad by connecting the last two outputs on the map set and adding another comment around this third group. Then apply, compile and save everything. The Niagara Editor UI tends to crash the engine so it's a good idea to save your progress quite often. Moving over to the particle update stage, the first step is to add a particle state. Here, the only change we need to make is to uncheck the option Kill particles when lifetime expires. This will make the particles live forever and ignore the lifetime property. After this step is where we're going to add all the forces applied to the system. For now, add a drag and when the error shows up, click the Fix Issue button to have the editor automatically add a Solve Forces and Velocity step at the end of the stage. Add also a Gravity Force to it. If we press Play now, all the particles fall together, which is almost what we want. Before we apply the constraints, we have to stop the pinned particles from accumulating forces, which means that we need to create another scratch pad. Don't worry though, this time will be a lot simpler than the last one. You can name this scratch pad something along the lines of ignore origin forces or ignore forces on pinned particles for something more explicit. 
Also, make sure that this step is placed before the solve forces and velocity on the stack. And now you know the routine. First, add the following variables to the map get node. From the transient namespace, physics drag and physics force. These are the temporary values calculated for this frame. From the particle namespace, velocity, mass multiplier, position, and is start node. And finally, from the emitter namespace, we'll need the origin position variable. The first part of this scratch pad is to cancel the drag, forces and velocity variables. To do that, multiply each one of those values by the mass multiplier variable, which, if you remember, is 0 for pin particles and 1 for the rest. Now, add these same three variables to the map set and connect each one to the correct multiply operation. On the map set, add also the particle position variable as I did here. To ensure that the first particle stays stuck to the origin, add a selector and connect the isStart node property to its input. After doing that, the true and false options will show up. Connect the origin position to the if true input and the position to the if false input. Then, connect the result of the select to the particle position in the map set. To check if this works, apply, compile and save, and then press play. The top particle should stay in place while the rest fall to their doom. And now get ready because we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes of the effect and for that we'll need to add a new simulation stage. Click the plus button at the top right of the emitter and select generic simulation stage. Now, select the settings and change the name to something like Solver or Constraint Solver. We also have to increase the number of iterations. In my tests, anything above 20 or so behaves pretty good. With too few iterations, the solution doesn't converge and the constraint behaves more like a spring. Add a new scratch pad to this stage and give it a good name. Here's where we're going to run our algorithm, so the obvious choices are Solver Step or Constraint Solver Step. Another scratch pad, another set of variables to add to the get and set maps. Starting with the get map, from the particle namespace, we need previous ID, next ID, position, and is start node. And from the emitter namespace, we need particle attribute reader and link distance. And for the set map, we just need the particle position. Since the actual solver will need a bunch of math nodes and it can get a little messy, we'll implement it as a separate Niagara function script which can be found and created in the Create Asset Context menu of the Content Drawer. This will keep the scratch pad free of clutter and also allow us to reuse this script in future effects. After saving and compiling it, the new function script can be added from the node library just like any other node. 
If your new custom function doesn't show up in this list, make sure to select Show All and uncheck the Library Only option at the top of the search box. Now, with the function open, remove the default vector input and add the following new ones. Three Niagara positions, name previous position, current position and next position respectively. Two different floats, name constraint length and convergence. And finally, a boolean, which will name is current pinned. This function will lead a single output, another Niagara position, to return the updated location of the particles after we apply the constraints. Give me a moment to finish setting up the function and organizing the graph so we can focus on the three position inputs for now. Like I explained at the beginning of the video, first we have to find out the distance to the neighbors, which in our case is the length of two different vectors, the current position minus the previous one, and the next position minus the current one. And instead of adding length operations, add two copies of direction and length safe. This version of the node has a fallback to prevent a division by zero error. Now subtract the constraint length input from each one of these lengths separately to get the difference between the current distance and the desired one. After that, we can divide these two numbers by the length, which will give us the ratio between these values. In both cases, we'll need to add a maximum between the length and a very tiny number to prevent another division by zero. These ratios that we just calculated can be multiplied by the subtract nodes at the beginning of this group to get two different vectors. In some way, you can think of this as the forces that are being applied by the neighbors when they pull or push to keep each particle at the correct distance. Now, we just need to average them and push the current particle in that direction. Start by subtracting the vector offsets from one another. Note that this time the inputs are reversed. I'm connecting the bottom row to the top input and vice versa. This will give us the offset towards the next particle minus the offset towards the previous one. And next, multiply the result of this operation by the convergence factor and then Multiply it again by 0 Now we have our final average offset, and all that remains is to add it to the current position and then use a select node to return the unmodified position in case that the current particle is pinned and cannot be moved. This concludes our custom script function, so we can go back to the scratch pad and fill the inputs with the correct values. Here, you can connect the link distance variable from the map get to the constraint length, is start node to is current pinned, and position to current position. On the other hand, 
conversions can be set manually. The value indicates how much the solution tries to approximate the correct distance on each iteration, with 0 being completely loose constraints and with 1 being fully rigid ones. For the remaining two inputs, previous and next position, we will need to use the particle attribute reader. Add a get position by ID for each property and connect the attribute reader and particle ID inputs. In the attribute field, type position. If you are wondering, get position by ID refers to the type of variable and the attribute parameter refers to the name of the variable that we are sampling. Once everything is connected, compile, save and apply and hit play. If everything is working correctly, the particles should stay more or less in their initial positions and remain attached to each other. We can add now another force, like a crawl noise or wind, to check how the constraint moves. And this looks pretty promising. Let's go back to the viewport for a moment to see how it behaves in the scene. Drag a copy of the actor blueprint or the Niagara system to the scene and move it around. Note that if you're using the actor, you'll have to be in play mode and then eject the camera to be able to do this. If you test the Niagara system directly, the effect still plays while being moved in the editor. Anyway, you might notice that when I move the chain of particles, they move very softly, for lack of a better term, and they just go back to the resting positions without any sense of weight. The reason for this is our constraint solver stage. You see, since we are applying the algorithm, after the solve forces and velocity step, the particles just move without supplying their kinetic force back to the system. However, the fix is quite simple. Add a calculate accurate velocity step to the solver stage right after the scratch pad. Once we go back to the scene and try again, we can immediately see the difference. The chain particles have more inertia and the whole effect feels much better in motion now. Congratulations, we got the hardest part out of the way. In the next section, we'll see some of the options available to display these systems in-game, starting with the ribbon renderer. Add one of these to the render stage and in the properties, change the shape to a tube and increase the number of subdivisions to 10 or so. Then, back in the initialize particle step, change the ribbon width mode to direct set and change the width to float from curve increasing the curve scale to around 50. However, since our particles don't age and live forever, we need to change the curve index from normalized age to normalized execution index. Once we do that, the ribbon width will correctly use the values defined in the curve. Let's go back to the editor and see this in-game, shall we? Ok, it looks pretty good. I think this could be used to make a Will of the Wisp type of magical creature or something like Tyrael's wings from Diablo. I won't go into details of how to make ribbon materials, but let me know in the comments if that is something that you would like to see in the future. Now let me change the visibility of the level geometry so I can illustrate some of the limitations of using ribbons. As you can see here, ribbons don't cast shadows or ambient occlusion and also don't show up in reflections unless you're using ray tracing. Note that the wall on the other side is only reflecting the emissive light from the material. On the other hand, ribbons can be smoothed out and curved without much extra cost, which makes them ideal to show complex, fast motions without the overall shape falling apart. The mesh renderer requires more setup and it could be a bit more expensive on the GPU but it is more flexible and, if you put on the work, can produce amazing results. Let's check it out. First, replace the ribbon renderer with a mesh one. In the parameters, replace the asset with a cylinder or some kind of vertical-ish geometry. First, replace the ribbon renderer with a mesh one. In the parameters, replace the asset with a cylinder or some kind of vertical-ish geometry. Here, I'm using this rounded cylinder I made, so the points where the meshes meet are more of a feature than a visual artifact, like the tentacles in the Sentinels from the Matrix movies. If we hit play, there's an obvious problem here. These meshes only know the rotation of their associated particles, so they keep their initial orientation. 
To fix it, we need to aim them towards one of their neighbors and update them every time that they move. This works best if the pivot point of your mesh is at the top or bottom. If the effect looks a bit weird when curving, make sure that the pivot is not centered in the mesh. I also gave the cylinders a simple rusted tech panel material that I made earlier to make things a bit more pleasing to the eyes. Let's start working on this mesh in order from the top. In the Initialize Particles section, change the Mesh Scale mode to Non-Uniform and to a Vector from Curve. Next, tweak the curve to get something that you like. In this case, I'm going to scale down the X and Y axis and keep the Z more or less the same. I want each chunk to get thinner and thinner, but not much shorter. Like I mentioned before, remember that normalized H doesn't work with this type of effect, so we need to change the curve index property to normalize execution index. In the particle spawn stage, I'm also going to add an initial mesh orientation and change the parameters to give its particle a random rotation around the vertical axis, so they look a bit more organic. This is an optional step that you might not need depending on your mesh and materials. There is no built-in way to get the direction we need, so we have to add our final scratch pad for today. Don't sweat it though, this one is a piece of cake compared to what we've been through. After creating and naming it, go back to the system overview and make sure that this module runs between the solver and the calculate accurate velocity steps. And once everything looks correct here, we can go back to the module and start adding variables to the map get. And these are the ones that we need to bring over. From the particles namespace, previous ID, next ID, position, and is end node. And from the emitter namespace, only the particle attribute reader. On the map set, Create a new vector type variable, name it mesh direction, and assign it the output namespace. Now add two copies of get position by ID, change their attribute to position and connect their inputs. After that, two copies of the track set up as follows. Previous position minus current and current position minus the next. From these two vectors here, the top one points to the previous neighbor, and the bottom one points to the next neighbor. We're going to use the latter, the next neighbor, for all particles, except for the last one, which obviously doesn't have a next. To do so, add a select and connect the isEndNode variable to its input. Then, the top vector goes into ifTrue, and the bottom vector goes into the ifFalse input. 
finally, connect the result to the map set. And now you can apply, compile and save, since we are done with this scratch pad. Now we just need to use the value that we just calculated to reorient these meshes. The easiest way to reorient a mesh is, as you might have guessed, a module called Update Mesh Orientation. If you cannot find it in the module search panel, make sure that you have Show All in the source filtering. After adding this step, select it and make the following changes in the Properties panel. First, change the orientation mode to Orient to Vector. Next, change the stabilization mode to Facing, and if your mesh has the pivot at the bottom, change the reference axis vector to 0, 0, minus 1. And finally, change the Facing direction to use the value that we just calculated in our last scratch pad. You can find those under the Output namespace in the parameter list. Sweet, now we can hit the play button and the meshes align correctly with the neighbors when they bounce around. Let's see how it looks in the main viewport with the rest of the environment. Yeah, it took some effort, but I think this looks great. The object is much more grounded in its environment and interacts with the lighting in great detail. Let's switch between mesh and ribbon renderer to compare them head to head. To be fair, I think this material does a bit of disservice to the ribbons. It looks great too, but the glow is hiding its biggest strength, which is the interpolation that round the edges and makes these perfect and beautiful curves with just a few nodes. If you ask me, I think that both approaches have their merits, and each one is best in class when creating certain kinds of effects. For the rest of this tutorial, I'll switch it back to mesh. And we made it to the last part of this video where we're going to talk about collision. In the particle update stage, add a collision module and place it just before the solve forces and velocity. If you look at the collision types, there are a few options, but the two that interest us are GPU depth buffer and GPU distance fields. The depth buffer would work in any project, but has a couple of severe limitations. The first one is the resolution of the buffer itself, and the second and biggest one is that it doesn't work behind occluded geometry. Distance fields don't have those problems, but you have to enable them in your project settings, which will add a small performance hit. And much like everything else, you need to evaluate your use cases to decide if this is a justifiable cost. For this example, I'll use distance fields, which I already had enabled. Back in the Niagara editor, we need to change some settings on the collision module. First, set the restitution to 0.1 to eliminate almost all bounds. Next, to keep things a bit simpler, we can keep the radius calculation type as a sprite, but if we do so, we need to make sure that the sprite size property exists. We can jump back to the initialize particle node and make sure that there's a value there. Since the sprite size is set to 20, I think that I'll set the radius scale to 1.5 back in the collision module. After that, the last change is to reduce the friction. Note that these values for restitution and friction work in my case, but you might want to tweak them to better suit your project needs. Great, the collision works exactly as intended but we could add some interaction with the environment to give it a bit more weight. Earlier, I made a quick and simple spark burst that would work perfectly to showcase this. Usually, to do something like spawn a second effect on collision, you would use a generate collision event module and then send that event data to a handler in a different emitter. However, because of how Niagara works, Event writes are not supported on GPU systems, so we need to find an alternative. 
Start by adding another generic simulator stage after the solver. This will be where we export the collision data. On the simulation settings, give it a name. This time we can leave the number of iterations to 1 since we only need to collect and send this data once per frame. We still have to pass a blueprint object reference to the Niagara module though. Go back to the user parameters on the system level and add a new object type parameter, which I will call export handler. Now we can add the module export particle data to blueprint to our export stage. On the settings, select the callback handler parameter that we just made and enable the delay between data export checkbox. Since we are doing a visual effect, we don't need each collision to be reported and we can save some precious milliseconds by adding a delay between messages. Note that although this workaround is perfectly valid to handle collisions, it can get easily out of control if tens of thousands of data exports are sent every frame. Another optimization is to reduce the amount of memory dedicated to this by changing the GPU allocation fixed size parameter. Again, for this type of effect, we can safely set to 1. Finally, set the condition to export particle data to the particle variable has collided. This will trigger an export each time that a particle collides with other geometry if the delay has already expired. However, if we just leave it like this, we'll have a problem. Let's go to the blueprint object to set it up and see what's up with that. The first thing to do in the actor is to go to the class settings and then add the interface Niagara Particle Callback Handler. We'll implement this interface to receive the export events from the Niagara system. Afterwards, right click on it and select Implement Event to add a copy to the node graph. Now we need to tell the system that this actor is going to take those messages. From the begin play event, add a set Niagara variable parenthesis object to the graph. The target variable is the system contained in the actor. The variable name in our case is sport handler and for the object add a reference to self. Cool, now this actor is ready to handle the events. Let's add a quick debug output so we can see the issue that I mentioned earlier. The export is an array of basic particle data objects. Add a for each loop, then break each data element, and for now let's just use a print string to output the collision location. If we go into the game and move the tentacle until it collides, at first it looks like it's working, we get some numbers when they bounce. However, once I move the object away and the collision stops, there's still a stream of coordinates coming from the debug output, which is obviously wrong. We'll have to go back to the Niagara system to understand what's happening here. Since our particles don't die or reset, the has collided variable that we were using as our condition to export data keeps being true forever after a single collision. Luckily, the fix couldn't be simpler. Add a set new or existing parameter directly step right after the export. Then add the has collided particle variable and keep the value as false to reset every particle after sending the data to the blueprint. After doing these steps, we can test it again and check that this time the debug output correctly stops when there is no longer a collision. Now that we've verified that our handler is working, we can replace the print string debug with a spawn Niagara system at the particle location and replace the asset with some fancy particles. In my case, I'll use this spark effect that I mentioned earlier. Ok, let's test the effect one more time. Yep, 
I think this looks pretty cool, and it is just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with this effect. Before we finish though, let me show you what I changed or added to the flying creature that I used at the beginning of the video. In my version, I lowered the gravity and increased the drag to give the tentacles a more floaty behavior. They also have a slightly different number of nodes, which makes them look a little bit more organic. I also parented them to the sphere and added a soft wind force in the opposite direction of the emitter, to give them the small bulging arc at the top and react to the parent movements in a better way. Next, to keep the sparks under some control, not every tentacle sends collision events, only like three of them. Since they are intentionally a bit messy, most times this cannot be even noticed. Finally, there is a panning curl noise to make the tentacles wiggle a little when the sphere is not moving. And that's it! If you made it to the end of this 50 minute long video, thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments other effects that you would like watching me breaking down. See you next time!